Some people say that the motto at NASA is, failure is not an option. But the truth is, they fail all the time. But their response to the failure tends to be, figure out what the problem was and try again. The biblical story is one of failure and recovery and failure and ultimately God's triumph. And that is our story as well. Uh, I was uh, one time when, uh, when Jenny was working uh, as, uh, with, with uh, child disaster relief after a terrible, uh, was a, which hurricane was it in Houston? Uh, in the I don't remember, which, what's that? Ike, Hurricane Ike, yeah. Anyway, Jenny was down there with some other folks, you know, helping with child care, and she came back and she brought me a mug, which was just huge, which was perfect for me, that said, failure is not an option. I'm afraid ultimately that mug failed, or maybe I did. I dropped it and it broke into a lot of different pieces, but, but I always like that. You know, that, you, hear, you hear the mission controller say that during the movie Apollo 13 because they really did say that. But, uh, you know, the road to space was filled with a lot of failures. Uh, one of my favorites, which you can look up on YouTube, is in the early days they had a, a, a redstone rocket with a mercury capsule on top. Uh, about a year before, Alan Shepard made his first ride into space for the United States. Uh, and, you know, had all the, all the dignitaries there, all the celebrities ready to watch it. Well, the rocket ignited, maybe rose an inch and then settled back down to the pad. And the engines cut off. And then the escape rocket on top of the Mercury capsule shot off into the air. And then the parachutes popped out. And then nothing happened. Well, nobody in the, uh, nobody uh, in, 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 in mission control would go out there to see what had happened because it was very dangerous. What had happened was that uh, you know, the, the, the rocket had ignited, detected a, a, a problem immediately, and it shut down, and maybe really hadn't moved more than a couple inches, but that was enough to pull the plugs out there at the base of the rocket that were connecting it uh, to an outside power source and put it on battery power. Well, the, uh, when, with the shutdown there, the, uh, uh, the Mercury program uh, told, told the escape tower, time to go, you know, so it took off. And then the capsule detected that it was well below the altitude at which the parachutes had opened, so it should open the parachutes. Meanwhile, there was a full tank of fuel, and until two hours later when the battery ran out, nobody would go out for fear that it would start up again. It was a spectacular failure in which nobody was hurt, but for which there were no explanations. While meanwhile, the Russian jug juggernaut was sending up bigger and bigger payloads into space. Uh, Another time, the, uh, uh, the Mercury astronauts were brought to watch an Atlas launch. The Atlas was going to put them in orbit, and much was made of that. They were all seated there. Uh, the Atlas climbed into space for about 23 seconds and then blew up, which, as, as one of the astronauts noted, now that would be the beginning of a very bad day. So uh, again and again, these failures popped up. One time, the failure resulted in the loss of three lives in the Apollo 1 fire, where a badly designed spacecraft and a hatch which would not allow the astronauts to get out very quickly, uh, you know, resulted in three deaths that didn't have to happen. Uh, but in, in every case, after failure came recovery, came self-examination, uh, often, often very rigorous and brutal self-examination to see where had pride led us? Why had we blinded ourselves to problems? And, of course, as one who's always been an enthusiast for spaceflight history, this is, you know, it is quite a story, and it continues to this day. And that, all those stories came back to me this week as I was reflecting on this scripture because the biblical story is full of failure. You know, we, we read, thank you, you did a good job, reading from the story of Jacob, uh, you know, and of course we're picking it up in mid-story, Jacob lying on the stone pillow and seeing 
that glorious sight of the stairwell or the ladder or whatever it was. You can translate the word several different ways. With angels ascending and descending, it makes a great painting. It is the subject of artwork. But of course, the story leading up to it is one of Jacob creating all these problems for himself. You know, uh, mother, mother had twins, and Esau was born first, but Jacob is holding on to his heel. And his name, Jacob, Jacob, means literally the supplanter, the one who grabs by the heel. You know, he's going to pull people in. He's going to, to put himself first at the expense of others. I used to have little chapel cards when I was at my first church in Los Angeles. And, and I, one of the stories that uh, uh, we would tell would be how, how Jacob had made a big pot of stew, and how his brother came in starving, and Jacob didn't just give him some. He said, I want your inheritance. I want, I want what you're going to inherit. And Esau, he knew Esau was one who thought from the stomach and maybe not from the brain, so you can say it was Esau's fault, and later ancient commentators tried to say it, but the fact is, if a family member comes in and they're hungry, what do you do? You serve them something to eat. If a total stranger knocks at your door and is hungry, what happened during the Depression? There's story again and again of people feeding folks on their way from nowhere to nowhere. It's one of the most elemental rules. In Hebrews 13, 2, it says, always show hospitality to strangers because some have entertained angels without knowing it. So why would you bargain with your brother? This is a flaw in Jacob, that all he can think of is, how do I get a little further? How do I keep myself at the center of the universe? How do I maintain my belief that I'm the most important person in the world? And then, of course, when it's time for, when it's time for Isaac, the patriarch, to give the blessing to the oldest son, Esau. And he tells Esau, go out and, and get me some wild game and bring it back. Go hunt, bring back what I like, and cook it. And, the, and Isaac's wife, the boy's mother, hears that and, and tells Jacob, you know, let, let's just cook a sheep. We're going to put the hair on your shoulders, you know, Make your voice sound a little lower or do whatever it is you have to, but we're going to fool your dad. That tells us right there that mother and son are colluding together to pull one over on the old guy. And as somebody who's becoming the old guy, I'm a little sensitive to this. It's easy to fool me. It's easy to draw me in. So, so the dysfunction between the brothers has spread to a dysfunction with the parents. And that's not going to go away. And, of course, Jacob does fool his father, even though he's not sure. Boy, you don't, well, you smell gamey. You must be, you must be the older brother. You know, you got all that, that sheep's fur on your, sheep's wool on your, uh, on your arms. But, but we have another, you know, once again, Jacob is cheating, is making himself the center of the universe. So, so this story that was read this morning is when Jacob is fleeing from the wrath of his brother who wants to kill him. And, you know, when he lies down at night, he always got is a stone for a pillow. And, and you know what? Jacob has been faithless, has been selfish. But what's extraordinary about this story is God has made a pledge to Abraham and his descendants. And no matter how we act, God is faithful in this pledge. It's not because we deserve it, but because God remembers all of us. He says, I made a pledge to you, and I will keep it. And so, while Jacob dreams, the skies open up, eternity enters, and there's a ladder, Jacob's ladder, 
with angels ascending and descending. And Jacob wakes up, as it says, uh, and Jacob woke, Jacob, Jacob woke up from his dream, and he was, he was really shaken. And he said, this, this is the place of the Lord, and I didn't know it. The place where we really feel like the props have been knocked out from under us, where we are running because we don't know what else to do, where we are afraid. That's the gate of heaven. As he says, surely this is the gate of heaven. And that reminds us that this is not just a promise to Jacob, but for all times. This, this story is said in ancient times. But by the time it is written down in this form, gate of heaven is really an important thing. It is, it is, the, it is what the word Babylon means. You know, Babylon... The evil empire considered itself the gate of heaven. And so this writer is saying to his time, we are afraid. We feel like failures. We, we stand in the shadow of an empire that chews up nations, that calls itself the gate of heaven. But we know, and this is the pun that's made in Genesis 11, we know that the word babel means that's what it means in hebrew babel means like in english it's one of those words we've kept it's a pun in almost every language so those mighty empires that think they're going to last forever they're just babel the real gate of heaven is not babel but it's us in our toughest places. We just sang Jacob's Ladder. What was that? That was a slave song. They are in a much worse place than you or I could ever imagine ourselves. Even when we feel pushed to our limits, none of you is a slave. We make jokes about it. Boy, I slaved all day and night. I'm a wage slave. Boy, standing there handing out pork chops for four hours in the pork tent. Boy, did I slave away. No, we're not slavers. But there were slaves then, and there are slaves now in our world. And, and hymns and songs remind them and us that God is still faithful. And to have hope and do not fear. Which brings us to the Isaiah passage, because that's where the phrase comes from that I wanted to focus on today. The people are frozen. You know, in, in the first 39 chapters of Isaiah, Isaiah talks about that Babylonian menace that's on the horizon and how it looks like there's no escaping it because we haven't repented, because we're still Jacob that's trying to put themselves first, who think we're the center of the universe, who have not turned back to God. And so, that's the first 39 chapters. After that, where we're reading from today, Isaiah is talking about a time when we come back. When we come back from Babylon. When Babylon is gone, and the exiles return. But even though they were told by the Persian emperor Cyrus, rebuild your temple! 16 years have gone by, and they're still too frozen because they're still in the mindset of living fearfully, of not recognizing that in our toughest moments, heaven's gate is opened up. And there is a connection of angels ascending and descending in those tough times. And so Isaiah says, you know, I, you know, uh, let's see. The Lord is saying, the Lord who is the king of Israel, I am your redeemer. It's that wonderful Hebrew word, goel. Goel is, is the person in your clan that fixes things. It's the rich uncle that pays people's bail. It's the person that makes sure if there's a problem, he knows who to call to get it fixed. God is your rich uncle. God is the one who's going to fix things. It will happen. It might take a while to make connections with people, 
But he says, I, he says, so says the Lord, the King of Israel, I, the Lord, am your Redeemer. Do not fear. You feel frozen because how can we make a temple that matches the temple from the old days? We'll never measure up to what previous generations are like. And God's message is, I am the first and the last. There, besides me, there is no God. You are serving the real God of the universe. Not the gods of Babylon, who claim to be the gate of heaven, but the real God. You know, this life is filled with failure and recovery and failure and ultimately God's triumph. It's easy in every age. You know, we, we always think we're unique. That things have never been as bad as what we've experienced. And that's why it helps to know your history a little better. We're not living in the Depression. We're not living in the era of fascism. Where millions of people die right and left. But we look at our problems and we think this is the worst it has ever been, which is not true. And we forget that we serve an awesome and a powerful God who is surely bringing things together at God's time. Now, I want everything done now. I want my problem solved now. I want all the ducks to line up in a row. And I never understand that because I've never seen ducks line up in a row for me. They might line up for each other when they're walking through the park. But... The big thing is, do not fear. We suffer. There are real problems in our lives as individuals, as a church, as a nation, as a world. But instead of saying failure is not an option, we need to remember that failure is a normal occurrence and self-examination and repentance and recovery and renewal are also a part, not only of the world around us with the four seasons, but of our lives. This week, reflect on your frustrations and your failures, but also reflect on the hope that is at the heart of Scripture. Do not fear. There was a whole world ahead for Jacob, and later for Jacob's descendants, and now for us. You ain't seen nothing yet. Trust me, good things are coming. Amen.